Good morning. It is good to see everybody this morning. I'm so glad you've come to uh, decided to come and join with us as we worship our Lord together. Uh, you may notice we have a distinctive lack of children. Uh, we have our, our Christmas uh, market going on in the multipurpose room, uh, and uh, they have uh, uh, all kinds of various things that they're going to be doing, uh, not just uh, uh, purchasing for giving to uh, uh, other needy children, but also uh, learning about why we do that, why we go about the work of charity in this world today. By way of announcements, uh, this week we will be having our Christmas Eve service here in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock on Saturday. That is Christmas Eve. Uh, so uh, everyone, please uh, uh, come and join us as we ring in uh, the, uh, the holiday season on that evening. Also, please remember that uh, next week we will have uh, no Sunday school. Worship is at the same time. It is at 1030. Uh, we will have Christmas worship uh, at 1030 Sunday morning here in the sanctuary. Oh, yes. I, was, I knew I had something I had to say, and it just stopped somewhere in my brain. But... Uh, the week after Christmas, so the 26th through whenever, um, the office will be closed. We're trying to do a whole lot of bookkeeping work and uh, trying to uh, transfer stuff from uh, one bookkeeper to another bookkeeper and uh, also finish out the year as much as we can before the year actually finishes out. So the office will be closed. We'll be uh, extremely busy trying to make sure that we get everything situated uh, with our finances and our other bookkeeping uh, duties. So if you do need uh, anything, though, please don't hesitate to call me on my cell phone, which is uh, usually available in the uh, bulletin. Let us prepare now as we worship together. Please rise and join with me and the rest of the praise team in your grace is enough and god rest ye merry gentlemen the songs are which are uh, on handouts on the end of your pews
I'm covered in your love. Your grace is enough for me. For me. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born upon this day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Blessed angel came, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same. How that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Amen. As you are seated, I would like to invite uh, George and Judy. Just George. Judy's not coming. You, you're not going to dazzle us with your visage. As George comes up here, I would like to uh, wish him a happy 942nd birthday. Um, it is actually George's birthday, and they stopped counting about three decades ago. So I don't know how old he is. I just know that when he talks about Jesus... It's from a first-person perspective. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, well, this, is, this is a scary place to be on a Sunday morning. Oh, fourth Sunday of Advent. December 18th was very...
speaking and said, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But when the king refused, God would not be stopped. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. God wants us to know, even when we aren't sure ourselves. God wants us to experience God's presence, even when we think we can handle life on our own. God sends us signs of God's presence with us. All we need to do is keep our eyes open and look. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. We light these candles. The candle of joyous hope. A proclaimed peace. A peace everlasting. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we thank you that you've brought us into this space once again. You've brought us here in a time of great beauty and hope, of great challenge, great concern. But nonetheless, you are present. And in your presence, we rest. We rest with peace and hope. We rest with the full knowledge that you have indeed won the victory. Help us today to hear your word read and proclaimed in such a way that it will transform our hearts so that as we come into that time when we celebrate the coming of your Son, we may do so with glad, generous, and clear hearts. We ask all of this in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You will please stand and join with us uh, once again. Uh, you have uh, the handout for Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Come and let us sing together.
hearts of shepherds, you draw the hearts of kings, even as a baby you were changing everything, you called me to your kingdom before your lips could speak, and even as a baby you were reaching out for me, and now we are awaiting the day You will please remain standing and join with me in our Apostles' Creed as printed in your hymnals on number 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds as we approach the throne of grace in prayer and bow our heads together. Holy and gracious God, we come to you today in anticipation, maybe a, a little of anxiety, maybe a, a little exhaustion from preparation, maybe just some some joy that we're starting to see those who have been away from us return for a short time. And we are talking to those we have not talked to in a while. That we are hearing your name a little more often simply because it's, it's the time of year when people are a little more open to how you have worked in this world. Lord, help us as we go into this place where you have placed us. This town, this community, you have prepared this place for us and this church for this place for a specific purpose. That is to reach people in your name so that they may know your love, the salvation that you bring, and the way of life that grants eternity. We pray, Almighty God, that we may have a passion in our hearts for those who do not know you, for those who have been given a poor image of you, for those who have been harmed by your followers, 
for those who have been beaten up by this world. Because we were once those people and you have rescued us. We were once those people and you have brought us into your fold. And you've shown us a better way, a holier way, a more grace-filled way. May we show such grace every day of this new year. We ask all of this in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, hear now the word of our Lord through his prophet Malachi. And now on the first day of the week, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Test me, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I do not throw open the gates of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you that cannot be counted. Let us pray. Holy God, you have given so generously. Help us to emulate your heart in such a way that others may see how freely you give of your grace and mercy. We ask all of this in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God from whom all blessings flow. Thank you, sir. Holy God, take this. Our scripture lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 1, 
verses 18 through 25. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I've always been troubled by this scripture. It's always given me a a bit of pause. You see if you notice what happens here. Joseph, in chapter 19, or verse 19, is considered a righteous man because he refuses to expose Mary to public disgrace. Let me tell you what this public disgrace actually is. Matthew was being a little... Uh, flowery with his language. The public disgrace was she was to be taken to the doorway of her father's home and stoned to death by the men of town. Seems pretty disgraceful. That was the law. Deuteronomy 22, if you want to look it up. Joseph, a righteous man, broke the law. Not just the law of the nation, the law of God. And yet, he is called a righteous man. He is called a righteous man, and he breaks the law before the angel tells him what's going on with Mary. He doesn't yet know that this is the son of the Holy Spirit in Mary. Joseph breaks the law. Joseph breaks scripture, a clear understanding of the scriptural law of the time. But this same scripture, albeit in a New Testament or New Covenant, calls him righteous. Why? That's always caught me off guard. It's it's all of the wonderful language in this and all that we can spend so much time on. I mean, the, the beautiful imagery of the idea of God with us. God present. The, the, the one and only God. The God that, that fills and surrounds all things. The God that created everything, seen and unseen, came to earth and could be seen and touched and held and heard. Emmanuel. It's easy for a preacher to jump straight to that. It's exciting. It's powerful. It's, it's something that I love to focus on as well. And yet, I've never preached on the idea about these first couple of verses. Because of all the beauty of the rest of the story. Because the the angel comes to Joseph and says, listen, you don't have to worry. This, This happened because it had to happen this way. Because the prophet said it would happen this way. And you get to be the earthly father of this child. 
in fact, the legal father of this child, because in, in Jewish law at the time, the man who gave the name to the child was that child's father. Period. So they called him Jesus. And Joseph became the father of this child. This baby. This baby that will transform all of the world, that will cause us to look back on all of the dealings between God and humanity and to reinterpret them. Because as Christians, we interpret Scripture through the first lens that is Christ. If it is Christ, if it lines up with Christ, if we understand it as Christ, then we will be able to understand the Scripture. Perhaps, perhaps even in his conception, Jesus was showing a little bit about what his life would be like. Because Jesus spent an awful lot of time walking around town and saying, you've read scriptures that say this, this, and this, but I'm going to say this, this, and this. Now, if I went around town saying that kind of stuff, I'm pretty sure I would be stoned to death. If I just decided to go out and say, now the scripture says this, but I'm saying this. No, you don't, uh, no, you don't do that. This is the Bible, right? You don't just get to, to make stuff up. You don't get to pick and choose. You have to take it as a whole. You have to, yeah, every little bit of the Bible, as the Bible says itself, is good for reproach for instruction. But then at his very conception, unknowingly, I think, the Father of Christ begins to emulate just what Christ is going to do. He is a righteous man. Before he even knows this is God's Son, he is a righteous man because his compassion overwhelms his understanding even of scripture now when christ walked around and said you have heard it said but i say to you it was not a dismissal of scripture it was a fulfilling of scripture because christ always made compassion the first and most important thing loving your God and loving your neighbor. These two things. All of the law and the prophets are hung on these two things. So Joseph, as a Bible breaker, as someone who we would throw right out the front w window, reject Absolutely. Because he broke the rules. He's righteous. He's righteous because a little bit of Jesus has already started to do its work. I wonder if Jesus didn't pick up on some of this. I mean, it was 30 years uh, traditionally before he started his ministry and and uh, surely Jesus would have been working with Joseph from the time he could pick up a hammer learning the family trade surely some of this rubbed off on him now what's sad is we don't hear a lot about Joseph after the birth narrative he just kind of disappears <laughs> I don't know what happens But we, we hear in the few verses about him that are said that he is so compassionate. He is a good Jew. He knows the law. He knows that he is to drag his betrothed out of her father's house to the front porch where the rest of the men in town will stone her to death. 
because in Deuteronomy 22, it says if, if there's any proof that she was not a virgin when you took her as your wife, well, then that's what you're supposed to do. Now, last I checked, being pregnant is a pretty good evidence, at least in our understanding, of not being a virgin. But Joseph says, no. That is not the way I will treat this woman. I will treat her with enough dignity that I can while still maintaining my own. Dismiss her quietly. Allow her to remain in her father's house and for the child to grow. Now, thankfully, the angel comes and gives Joseph a, a little more uh, comfort. I wonder if Joseph ever, uh, before the angel came, I wonder if he, if he was concerned about breaking the rules. I wonder if he was afraid someone would find out. Or was it just common that the Jews didn't really follow all the laws? I don't know. This is a strange text for us to dive into, to say, all of a sudden we're not following Scripture anymore? Are we throwing the baby out with the bathwater? But the angel comes and says, no, don't worry, you don't even have to put her aside to save your dignity. You've been blessed, just as she has been blessed. She will be the God-bearer. You can freak out your Baptist friends by using the word theotokos, the bearer of God. They'll think you're speaking in tongues and fall at your feet probably. But Joseph, Joseph will probably be the one that has the most time to spend with him as he grows. And we can see how the compassion that he showed Mary rubbed off on the sun. We can see this even more powerfully. And imagine that Joseph had told Jesus all about his birth. I would assume he would. And, he said, and Joseph said, I was about to uh, dismiss your mother. I was about to break break scripture and dismiss your mother quietly. But then an angel told me. And then later on, Jesus is walking through town and a bunch of men throw a woman at his feet. Saying she has been caught in adultery. I wonder if Jesus didn't look down at that woman and didn't see the face of his own mother. What should have occurred? What should have ended him right there? I think it's rather uh, hilarious, a little bit ironic, that without someone breaking scripture, we would not have a, sal a, a, a savior. <laughs> that, that, that comes across as strange to me. If it weren't for Joseph being disobedient to the scripture that he knew, and yet obedient to the Holy Spirit, to the angel who came to him, and ultimately obedient even if it took on shame for him, even if someone found out that Mary had gotten pregnant before they were wed, even all of that, he remained obedient, and he grew and led and fed, and provided for, and taught the Son of God in his own home. I think we have to thank Joseph for the fact that Jesus goes around all of his country telling people that the heart of the person 
is more important than the letter of the law. And that's very strange to me as someone who has spent quite a bit of time studying the scriptures. Someone who has dived into parts of scripture that probably weren't supposed to be studied that much. Remember, these were things that were stories that were just told orally, and I can argue over the placement of a comma if you want me to. I can argue over a prepositional phrase for days. And yet, even in his conception, even before he is present, Jesus Christ is changing the rules. Jesus Christ is causing us to look at the way God wants to relate to us in a completely different way. Because this Emmanuel, this God with us, this is God reaching out. Because God also believes that the hearts of the people are more important than the letter of the law. Because for God, perfection incarnate, to become incarnate in human form, he had to take on every broken frailty of humanity, every piece of limitation, every piece of fallenness. And on the cross, he did exactly that. He brought all of the sin of people upon him, past, present, and future. And he said, I have solved this problem. And we have been set free. We have been set free. Because Christ is the fulfillment of the law from the day he was conceived. Christ is the fulfillment of the law for everyone, everywhere. Bob Goff, he's a motivational speaker, but he's, uh, he's also um, very, uh, a very faithful man. He, he has kind of a crazy life, um, uh, and if you ever read any of his books, you'll, you'll pick up pretty quickly that he's, he's a little off. He's a, he's a unique individual. I'd, um, go check out, uh, he's on uh, TED Talks, and you can look up Bob Goff, G-O-F-F, um, and uh, he'll have various videos on his own website. But he has a book called Everybody Always. And in that book, he, he talks about how we can be a powerful, positive force in the world. And this dude exudes it. I mean, like, he walks into a room and the place just lightens up. Like, he's beaming. It's, it's I don't understand how he does it. He, he, he just... He walks in, and his very presence lifts a weight off your shoulder. He says, we can be that. Jesus Christ solved the problem of sin for everybody, always. He is God with us. He is the one who has reached out toward us. He is the one who has made the first steps. He is the one who has told us, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. We were talking in Sunday school this morning about salvation and the, the common understanding of salvation where folks will say you need to invite Jesus into your heart and yet you, you have to pray the sinner's prayer and you know then you're saved as if it's momentary thing now I'm not going to knock it uh, too bad um, because it does it does work but has, has anyone in here been saved by someone hollering at you from the, the sidewalk no 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 
you know, signs you're going to hell, that doesn't make you want to jump right into a relationship with Jesus. And it made me wonder what it looks like for our understanding of salvation, which is God making the moves. God reaching for us. God hunting us down like the shepherd after the one leaving the 99. Like a woman who lost a coin and she literally takes everything out of her house to find it. Like a man who finds a treasure in a field and to make sure that that treasure is his, instead of just going out and digging it up, he goes out and buys the whole field. None of it makes sense, you see. Why would you waste an entire day taking everything out of your home to look for what was essentially just a couple of days wage you wouldn't you'd be like huh well lost that in the dryer with the rest of those socks right you wouldn't go buy a field because you found a treasure in it you'd dig that sucker up in the middle of the night and you'd run somewhere and say i found this somewhere else let's let's be honest Instead, we know that God is the one that's reaching for us. That God said, I don't care about the limitations. I don't care that me stepping from perfection into imperfection is going to make me look a little weaker than it might have before. God's sovereignty as king is in his service, in his emptiness in his self-giving, in his love, in his compassion over the letter of the law. I love our holy scriptures. They are beautiful. They have shaped my entire life. They've given me a purpose. They've introduced me to a Jesus who I later met in person. But when they become what we worship they become an idol in and of themselves when compassion takes a back seat to the letter of the law we fail to be the people that Christ has called us to be do we live up to the standards of the law absolutely not scripture tells us we were never meant to. The law was supposed to show us that we can't. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus chose to do what Jesus did. Enter into our world. To be with us. To share with us. To grace us with his presence. Last week... talked about the idea that there is no such thing as too much grace. This past week, I got really upset over some stuff that was going on in the, in the conference level. We had a couple pastors that, in my opinion, were not living uh, up to the, the ethical guidelines that they have set for themselves much less that they should be living up to they chose to represent another denomination and try to keep their ordination in this denomination and so uh, because it is actually a chargeable offense I contacted my district superintendent and said do you know about this I didn't know this was possible uh, this is a problem and I got a little self-righteous. And I said, you know, do we need to bring them up on charges? Well, the DS thankfully had a cooler head and said, we're looking into it. I'll send you some details later. So they looked into it, and basically what they did was just kind of, at first I thought it was sweeping things under the rug. 
And then I remembered my own stinking sermon the week before. I've usually Jesus juked a lot of people, but rarely myself after the fact. Like the week leading up to, I get beat up by the scripture while I'm trying to write the sermon, but usually it doesn't happen after I've preached it. No, this time it came right back and slapped me on the back of the head and said, Joe, you just preached a sermon that said there ain't no such thing as too much grace. Oh, yeah. Because it's more important. Their actions are not important. My actions are important. How I act the grace that I show, the life that I live, the witness that I give to the world. We are being grace-filled because we know that Christ came to be with us only through immense grace. We are being grace-filled because we know that we have only been welcomed into his family only by immense grace and we can only witness to this grace when we act it out ourselves and so God gave me a little reminder to practice what I preach and to remember that I have already been shown way too much grace to be a little self-righteous over someone else's action and that quite possibly, just maybe, by continuing to show too much grace, others will come to know the Christ that I've known all along. The one that's shown us since his very conception, that compassion, a deep love for our sisters and brothers across this globe, is what is going to transform this world. Nothing else. There will be no changes through debate. There will be no changes through uh, uh, getting things codified into law. Only love is going to show the way. Thank God that love presented itself in the form of a human being. And even before that, started changing the minds of those around him to let them know that care for one another throughout this world, over and above the rules of law, and sometimes, sometimes even over and above what we think the scripture might say. That is what is going to usher in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, we know that we know only in part because your holy scriptures have told us that we know only in part. Forgive us for when we act like we know in fullness. God, we have seen you time and time and time again continue to expand your kingdom past the limits that previous people believed were possible. From the very beginning, you have shown us that you will welcome people that we didn't think you liked. That we thought, in fact, and that your scriptures even say you have rejected before. God, we pray that when we read your scriptures, that your Holy Spirit will speak through them and show us. Not just their meaning, but how to see these things through the person of Jesus Christ. The one who came to save all people from their sin. The one 
who will stand with us at judgment and say they are mine. The one who continues to speak into our lives and remind us that our witness is to show too much grace in a world that shows none. In your holy name we pray. Amen. If you will, please stand and join with me to number 250 in your hymnals as we sing together verses 1, 2, and 4 of Once in Royal David City. As you go from this place, don't go telling everybody the preacher said I don't have to read the Bible. That's not what I said. So just if you're unclear on that, please come to the office. As you go from this place, receive this blessing upon your lives. May the power of Almighty God keep you safe from all harm. May the glory that is our risen Savior shine through you for all this world to see. And may in every house my Christ be your guest. Amen. <laughs>